You're watching Saturday Anime on the Sci-Fi Channel. Greetings, this is Reverend Paul, and this, of course, is Raw. And once again, I am joined by Reverend Jim. Jim, how are you doing? Well, you miserable people of the internet. You've done good to tune into this show, because this is the show that's got it all. We've got it. You, you, you too bad coming in. Just don't go away. I'm fine. How are you? I'm okay. Today, we are going to talk about Godzilla vs. Biolanti. One of my favorite Godzilla movies. It's definitely in the top 10. I don't know if it's top 5, but it's definitely in the top 10 for me. Godzilla vs. Biolanti is one of those movies that I think gets better. There are a couple of movies like The Matrix or Conan the Barbarian that are movies that I think get better every time you watch them. And I think Godzilla vs. Biolanti is one of those movies. I completely agree. The more I've watched it, the more I latch on to certain details or certain characters or even just certain scenes and I just get something more out of with each viewing. I've realized just how well made of a Godzilla movie it is. I wish that there could be more Godzilla movies like this in a way. Don't get me wrong, I love the Monsterverse movies, but I feel like they don't always have something to say. A lot of it just turns into our family is separated and this monster attack brought our family back together. Whereas this has something to say about science, about ethics. It's got a lot of really interesting ideas to it, and it's one of the reasons that I've always been a science fiction fan and why I've always been a Godzilla fan, is that it explores these ideas in an intelligent way while also giving you giant monsters. Godzilla vs. Biolanti was released on December 16th, 1989, and it is the sequel to Godzilla 1985, otherwise known as The Return of Godzilla. Whereas The Return of Godzilla was much more of a Cold War movie, and it was much more of an allegory about the tensions between the United States and Russia, Godzilla vs. Biolanti is a movie that's more about genetic modifications, and especially, like, I guess, the way we modify our food and things like that. The idea of using genetic engineering and the potential of playing God with that and what kind of monsters and abominations could come about from that when you mix that kind of science with people's greed. And you get that with, even just in the opening minutes of the movie, it takes place a few hours after Godzilla has fallen into Mount Mihara. They start off with a news broadcast telling you that Tokyo is pretty much ruined. And was this the first time in any kind of kaiju movie that they start looking at, all right, we need to go and collect samples of whatever cells this monster left behind? It's the first time I can remember seeing it, where we see them collecting pieces of Godzilla's skin that's been left. Yeah, and they're collecting it, they're keeping it in a jar, and it immediately starts going into an 80s action movie for a few minutes because some of the people that are there collecting Godzilla cells are not supposed to be there and when they pull out guns and start shooting at some of the people that are supposed to be there things get ugly really quick and I don't just mean the terrible acting by some of the people in that group. It is funny because like the first 10 minutes of this movie is in English. We're just like horrible American actors. Or Australian. Yeah they're doing like a bad Italian fucking knockoff action movie. <laughs> Part of the charm of this movie is that it does feel different from other Godzilla movies and because this was one of those few movies where director Kazuki Omori had a lot of control, whereas later on with Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah and Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla, Toho took more control and wanted to have more of a formulaic Godzilla movie. That's always how it goes, To They give Kazuki Omori pretty much the keys to the car. He writes and directs it, and he's pretty much given car blanche. And he makes this very well-spoken film that harkens back to the original themes of Godzilla, where it's, does science go too far, or is it the people that use science for their own ends that makes it dangerous? And like any other franchise, the people that wear the suits and give the money start thinking that they're filmmakers and start saying, that, no, you should do this instead. And the movies that they make after Afterwards are still excellent Godzilla movies, but this one really has a, a very singular voice to it. It feels less homogenized, I think, is the best way to put it. Omori said he wanted to make a James Bond movie, which is why we have this weird corporate espionage subplot in the beginning, where we have the Japanese government collecting Godzilla cells, and then we have an American corporation collecting Godzilla cells. They're there illegally, they're pursued by the JSDF, and then they are attacked by this other dude who's like, he looks like some 
someone from like a Lucio Fulci zombie movie, like this dude with a really bad beard, and he steals the G cells. I was gonna say he looks like someone that's doing a bad John Woo cosplay. Yes, there is a lot of like John Woo isms in here, especially when they're doing the drop off with that nuclear suitcase. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good point. There's a lot in this that really makes it stand out from other Godzilla movies, and it's got a lot more of a, an American bent to it, but it's still a Japanese story being told. And one of my favorite things that I've noticed about it in the last watch through I did, Kazuki Omori talked about how with the return of Godzilla, he didn't like that movie. And he said he doesn't think this is what a Godzilla movie should be. Yet, he still pays respect to it. He's still respectful of what was made before him, and he's not treating it like if it were being written today, you'd see someone saying, like, oh, Godzilla fell into the volcano, but later on that day he escaped and will make a gag out of it, turning the movie into the butt of a joke. Whereas here, Omori is actually being respectful to what came before and then building upon it to go and make things a little stronger. You don't see considerate writing like that nowadays. Godzilla vs. Biolanti tonally actually feels like very similar to Shin Godzilla. It has that same earnestness to it. In preparation for this video, I rewatched Godzilla 1985. And then there's this one part where Professor Hayashida says, Kaiju appear when the world is unbalanced. And you see that with Godzilla 1985. That is very much about the arms race between the United States and Russia. I do feel like Godzilla versus Biolanti is a little bit more representative of the modern dilemmas we have now. Godzilla 1984 is much more of a Cold War movie. This is a post-Cold War movie. It even goes a little beyond just Cold War. It includes other countries that may not have been included in the return of Godzilla by including the country of Saraudia out in the Middle East or showing we have not even just other countries, but corporations that are willing to kill to get these Godzilla cells or to get the anti-nuclear energy bacteria that's being developed through these Godzilla cells. That beginning, despite the bad American acting, it's actually pretty compelling. You have the guys getting attacked by the JSDF and the people that are there illegally to go and steal Godzilla cells, and then they're attacked by a Middle East secret agent, and he takes the cells to the Middle East, brings them to the head of an oil company who wants to go and use these for his own gain, and that's what tends to kick off the plot as far as what creates the creature Biolanti. You have Dr. Shirigami, who is working out in the Middle East for this oil company. They get him Godzilla cells so that he can go and do some genetic studies on it. And thanks to corporate terrorism, a bomb goes off. Some of the Godzilla cells there are destroyed, and the terrorist attack also takes the life of his daughter, Erica. You talked about Hiroshima being the best character, and he definitely is the most rational person. Because what we find out with Dr. Shiragami, he has taken wheat, and he has crossed the genes with something else where they can make wheat grow in the desert. Which is like, to me, it feels like, okay, mission accomplished. You made wheat that can grow in the desert, but that is not enough. What they want to do now is Shiragami and that evil Italian dude, they want to now take that wheat and put Godzilla cells in it. <laughs> which is like, I would not eat bread that was made from Godzilla cells. I don't know why they think this is a good idea. I wouldn't mix Godzilla cells with anything. The fact that they're even saving them is just like, you're asking for trouble. And lo and behold, it does come to bite the world on the ass. And Dr. Kirishima is that voice for it. If anything, I'm surprised it's not a more violent conflict going on between these corporations all scrambling to try and get the cells of the giant atomic dinosaur. It's almost as if this exists in some kind of libertarian world where corporations are literally at war with each other. I believe it's the American corporation that bombs Seradia and kills Erica. What was it? The conglomeration of four American companies that form the corporate terrorism group Biomajor. After his daughter is killed, Dr. Shiragami, he basically splices her genes with a rose so she will live on. Yeah, Erica, when she was killed in the terrorist attack, died next to this, not a bouquet, but this arrangement of roses. And Dr. Shiragami believes that her spirit passed into these roses. And he's kept them alive from 1984 all the way to uh, 1989. And still earnestly believes that her spirit is in those roses. He introduces us to one of the most enduring characters of the entire Heisei series, Miki Sagusa played by Megumi Odaka. Yes, and Miki is part of this psychic institute where they are trying to basically read the mental energy of plants. And that psychic institute is headed by Asuka, who is in a relationship
relationship with Kirishima. And what I thought was funny about Asuka is that when she was talking to Dr. Shiragami, she was talking about her father's experiments, which is basically just to save the sperm of Nobel Prize winners. It's like, that's just eugenics. Yeah, no, that's... I can see how Kirishima would also have problems with that. What was it? I actually found the relationship between Kirishima and Asuka really mature, well put together relationship. It seems like they're both jiving really well with each other. You see them constantly having these very intelligent discussions. They may not always agree, but there's always something that leaves one person or the other very thoughtful and with something to consider that may change how they think later on in the movie. It's something I've ne I don't recall I've ever seen in any other Godzilla movies was an adult relationship that's played this seriously. Yeah, this movie and Godzilla 1985 are very adult movies. There's no little kid that just gets strung along to have like the kid point of view. These are movies told from an adult perspective and they feel very mature in that way. Yeah, Omori in his writing took the ball and ran with it. He not only gives you a Godzilla movie with a very wide global view, but it also maintains that maturity. It maintains an intelligence that I feel a lot of monster movies usually lack and the best Godzilla movies always have in spades. Now what ends up happening is the government basically wants to make an anti-Godzilla bacteria, but they need G-cells to do it. And they want Shiragami to be part of the team, but he refuses. But then he eventually decides to join them when he realizes that the Erica plant is dying and he wants to fuse Erica with G-cells. Not only is the roses that he's been keeping uh, that he believes carries Erica's spirit, not only are those roses dying, they're dying because earthquake went off that caused an eruption at Mount Mahara, the same volcano Godzilla fell into. And as things go on, you find out that eruption was caused by someone waking up. And that starts to be this little undercurrent that just builds so well throughout that first third of the movie. My favorite moment in the whole thing, Asuka goes to the ESP Institute to talk to Miki Sagusa, and Miki Sagusa's been working with these children that have latent ESP powers. And the best part is that it's never said directly. Asuka and Miki are just having this talk. Miki just says, like, it started the other day, and now other children are starting to see it. They open the door, there are the kids, like, okay, kids, have you finished your drawings for today? Yeah! All right, let's see them. And it's all drawings of Godzilla and the world in flames and it chills me every time. I love that scene so much. I agree. The build in this movie is a lot better than the build in Godzilla in 1985, where he's just standing there and they pan up. This, we have the whole Godzilla threat levels where they explain like level one, level two, level three, level four. And I love that part with the psychic kids because that's almost like the Call of Cthulhu where everybody is dreaming about Cthulhu. Like now everybody is dreaming about Godzilla. Would you say that it's got a better sense of dread to it than... Godzilla 1985, because I feel like the build in 1985, it's got certain qualities to it that I think work really well. I mean, yeah, in the end, he just shows up at the power plant and it kind of just happens. But here, the build is also interspersed with other plot elements. You have the story with Dr. Shiragami using the rose cells with Godzilla cells. You have the intrigue of, all right, we're going to use these Godzilla cells to create anti-nuclear energy bacteria. But it turns out some of these other companies and corporations also want to get their little bit of the pie and are willing to go and commit murder to do it. Biomajor, the terrorist organization, sends two of their agents to break into Dr. Shiragami's lab to go and steal the Godzilla cells. And then when they get in there and they think that they're all right, a big green plant tentacle just comes in, strangles one guy to death, and the other guy barely escapes. Oh, and it turned out that the secret agent from the beginning of the movie is also there because the people of Seradia want the Godzilla cells for themselves. It is the only time I think Biolanti kills somebody in that movie. She kills one of those uh, American terrorists, and I would argue that kill was in self-defense, which makes me believe that Biolanti is the real hero of this film. I could work with that, yeah. One of my favorite moments actually is comes from the battle between her and Godzilla in Lake Ash Shinoko, where at the very end, you see her just bring up her vines in this really defensive move and you hear her give out this cry. It generated such sympathy 
atrophy from me. And it still does, because it just seems so helpless in that form, even with the tentacles that are spraying acid in Godzilla's face. It may possibly be Erica's spirit that is guiding Biolanti in there. It could even be something along the likes of Orga from Godzilla 2000, where it's simply fighting Godzilla just out of defense. It's frightened. You do get the sense that Biolanti is this organism that is trying to find purpose. It doesn't really understand what it is because there's this one sequence where when they're all talking and then the doctor says Biolanti isn't separate from Godzilla. Biolanti is Godzilla. And so I think there is this internal conflict within Biolanti when it first starts to appear. Because when it first appears, Miki is able to communicate with Erica. Then Erica goes away and then we just have the monster. So I think there's a conflict within Biolanti where there's the Godzilla self and then there's the Erica self. Yeah, I would say Miki is really the person that helps translate all of it for the audience. She's able to go and sense when Erica's spirit is there. She's able to go and sense when Erica's spirit is, wait, it's not there anymore. Then towards the very end when Biolanti is turning itself into the dust and going up into space, she can sense Erica's spirit in there again. That ending sequence is interesting to me because before that, when we have Biolanti as the giant rose, when she evaporates, we see the image of the monster Biolanti. And then when we next see her again, she's that giant Godzilla Biolanti. So the fact that when we see her after her fight with Godzilla and we see Erica, that leads me to believe that Biolanti is not dead, but she is going to come back as Erica. I can go along with that. I'm so surprised we have not seen Biolanti more because Biolanti is almost like Mothra, where she is this ethereal thing. I don't think she's really dead. I think she can come back as Erica. I think she could turn back into Biolanti. She's almost evolved past Godzilla, it seems like. Yeah, you really see that too during the end credits. After she turns into spores and flies out into the sky, during the end credits, you see the uh, the rose petals there out in space. And when she was just the rose there in Lake Ashinoko, she never really bloomed. You never really see those rose petals open up. When she's finally out into outer space, she's formed those rose petals and she's blooming. She's become her own person, her own thing, her own being. And that could be because of Erica's spirit guiding her. <laughs>